I'm honored to be one of the speakers, so thank you for inviting me. So here's my topic, uh, bloodless medicine surgery programs, a win-win for improving clinical outcomes. And uh, so this is where I practice as an anesthesiologist at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Uh, this is our brand new building uh, that recently went up, uh, the Zayed Bloomberg New Clinical Buildings. And Johns Hopkins has a long history. If you go all the way back to, uh, if you go all the way back to uh, Denton Cooley, who uh, is considered to be the father of bloodless medicine. Um, he uh, went to medical school and did residency at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Uh, he also implanted the first artificial heart. Uh, and when he finished a training at Johns Hopkins, he went down and founded the Texas Heart Institute in Houston. And uh, the reason he's considered the father of bloodless medicine is he had this paper in JAMA in 1977 uh, with over 500 procedures performed without transfusion. And this is, by the way, before the cell saver was even invented. So he, he had an early version of the cell saver that he uh, constructed, which is basically a, a way to return a shed blood back to the bypass uh, circuit during open heart surgery. Hang on one sec. Yeah, Steve, if you could get your picture your video to show. We are seeing Queen Ed's face here. And I doubt that she's right. the one speaking. So, um, every good talk needs a disclosure slide. Uh, this is mine. Um, I'm on the ASA Committee for Patient Blood Management. Uh, I'm active in SABM and also in uh, the AABB. And I just want to point out that uh, Bloodless medicine is now at the forefront. Uh, when they start featuring bloodless medicine articles on the covers of our journals, that's when you know that, that we made it to the forefront. Uh, so for example, uh, just a, a year and a half ago, we had the proceedings from, uh, uh, from our SABA meeting on a bloodless panel. Uh, that were featured on the cover of, of Anesthesia Analgesia. And uh, you can see they're talking about cell salvage, uh, erythropoietin, IV iron, and avoiding blood transfusion on the cover of one of our biggest journals. In fact, in that article, um, I uh, gave a table about the legal issues with bloodless medicine in the 1960s the legal climate was uh, against the patients to refuse transfusions in the 60s. Uh, the courts challenged patients' right to refuse blood. But by the 1980s or 90s, the courts started to side in favor of the patient's right to refuse uh, because of a case in Canada uh, where the doctor was held uh, guilty of, of assault or battery by transfusing a patient against their will. So ever since the, about 1990, the patients have gained uh, the uh, ability to refuse treatment. Uh, also, um, bloodless medicine techniques such as uh, cell salvage have made it into the mainstream media. Uh, for example, we had this paper uh, in 2014 uh, that was written up in the New York Times uh, about reusing a patient's own blood during surgery. That's what they called it. Uh, we call it cell salvage. And uh, we, we showed that cell saver blood is higher quality than banked blood uh, because it hasn't been stored in the blood bank and it was relatively fresh. Uh, so the 2,3 DPG levels were higher and the, the red cells uh, well, functioned better uh, compared to banked blood. And uh, just uh, to show how bloodless medicine has, has now been accepted into the journals and, and by uh, 
clinicians around the country. Uh, now the uh, American Society of Hematology uh, allowed this article to be published on uh, what to do when you can't transfuse. And then the journal Transfusion uh, is now uh, publishing papers, of course, on bloodless medicine, which seems kind of ironic that the journal would be named transfusion and publishing papers about not transfusing. So we've had a program at our hospital uh, for bloodless medicine since about 2012. And uh, we, we had to learn how to do it uh, based on uh, previous uh, uh, articles and lectures by Dr. Shander and Dr. Waters uh, who had been doing this before we had. And so we, we did some reading and we built a program in the last eight years. And uh, we were privileged to be able to uh, write this article on the methods used for bloodless medicine. And uh, when I sent in the article, the, the editor said, why don't you make a top 10 list and then people will read it. Uh, because otherwise uh, it wasn't quite as exciting. So we, we called it the top 10 things to consider uh, for bloodless medicine. And I'm gonna go through those one at a time now. So here's the top 10 things to consider. We'll start with the evidence, the patients, the provider team, which you've heard some uh, about already, uh, preoperative preparation, uh, I'll tell you how the MSBOS can be helpful in a bloodless medicine program. And then we'll talk about intraoperative methods of uh, keeping the blood in the patient. That's what I like to call it, uh, both anesthetic techniques and surgical techniques. Uh, we'll talk about the cell salvage and uh, phlebotomy blood loss and then artificial uh, blood or hemoglobin based oxygen carriers. So first the evidence. We now have probably more evidence in the literature uh, showing that less is more for transfusion uh, than, than uh, almost any other practice in medicine. Where else do you find uh, nine landmark studies uh, that support doing anything uh, that all say the same thing. Uh, every one of these studies shows that giving less blood is either as good or better than giving more blood uh, in these randomized trials. And you can see even in pediatric patients, uh, even in uh, traumatic brain and cardiac surgery. And when we started our program, uh, we took the first uh, 300 patients that we enrolled and we uh, compared our, our bloodless patients to a group of propensity matched controls uh, who uh, were able to be transfused. And we showed that uh, the patients did either as well or better. So here's the outcomes that we looked at uh, in the bloodless patients in blue and the control patients in red. Uh, when you looked at cardiac, respiratory, renal, thrombotic, uh, uh, we found no difference in, in morbid outcomes. Uh, infections, uh, that's hospital acquired infections, there was a trend towards uh, less infections. And then we also had uh, less mortality, but we weren't powered to look at mortality. There was only one death out of 300 patients in the bloodless group. So we weren't powered for that outcome. We also looked at costs and uh, we found about a 12% decrease in cost and charges for the bloodless patients compared to the controls. Uh, so, so this is essentially because uh, the patients were getting less uh, treatment in terms of transfusion and, and uh, this even accounts for uh, treating pre-op anemia. So number two is the patients themselves. So who are the patients that need bloodless care? So it's primarily Jehovah's Witness patients, about 90% of them. Uh, however, there are others uh, as well. 
And if you ask patients ahead of time if they'd like to avoid a transfusion, you get a fair number of patients that simply want to avoid them for personal reasons. Uh, often, we, we also have uh, patients with alloantibodies that can't be transfused, um, especially our sickle cell patients. They develop so many alloantibodies uh, that, that, you, that you can't find a cross match. So these patients, uh, we've had about 400 inpatients a year uh, and many, many outpatient visits, over 2,000 outpatient visits per year. So people get confused that don't know a bloodless medicine about which components uh, the Jehovah's Witness uh, population will accept and which ones they will not accept. Uh, so we tried to make it simple with this diagram. And uh, the major fractions, uh, that's, that's the terminology used by the, the Jehovah's Witness uh, patients, are the red cells, white cells, plasma, and platelets. And, uh, and then the, the minor fractions uh, down below in green are considered to be a personal choice. Uh, and those include uh, fractions made from plasma, uh, such as uh, cryoprecipitate, immune globulins, uh, even PCCs, prothrombin complex concentrate, uh, which is uh, human-derived uh, factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. Uh, so there's also hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers that we'll cover in a minute. So who are the providers that care for the patients? So we like to say that bloodless medicine is a team sport. Uh, we have uh, everybody on board in terms of specialties, uh, anesthesia, of course, surgery. Uh, hematology plays a huge role. Uh, we have a, a hematologist that's dedicated to our service uh, that specializes in uh, treating pre-op and post-op anemia. Uh, perfusion, uh, of course, can do what I call their magic to uh, conserve blood during cardiac surgery. Nursing, as we heard from Cassandra uh, in the talk uh, just before this one. Um, cardiology, pharmacy, the blood bankers themselves uh, can help. And these are all the providers uh, in surgery and OBGYN, internal medicine, uh, all the specialties in the first year at Hopkins that participate in care of bloodless patients. So once they know you have a program for bloodless medicine, uh, the providers are much likely to be on board because they, they believe that you'll take care of all the details. So here's our team uh, when we started. And uh, these are some of the uh, players on our team. Our, Linda's our hematologist. Isha Shirt, our nurse coordinator. Uh, Liza is a surgeon. Andy Pippa is our administrative coordinator. Paul Ness runs our blood bank. Number four, uh, preoperative preparation. So, of course, uh, everybody knows the importance of treating preop anemia. And uh, it's, uh, it's not as easy as it seems because you need to know who to treat and how aggressively to treat for preop anemia. Uh, for example, if you're coming for a thyroidectomy, uh, where you're going to lose what I call uh, about a tablespoon of blood, uh, then you don't have to be aggressive in treating pre-op anemia. But if you're coming for a Whipple for pancreatic cancer, for example, uh, then the blood loss can be pretty dramatic and you have to get more aggressive. So uh, we made a little video here about uh, building your hemoglobin level without blood. And just simply increasing iron intake in your diet uh, can be helpful for some people. Ah, so then uh, we talk about erythropoietin. And uh, I'm a, a cyclist myself. My, my hero, or one of my heroes, is Lance Armstrong. Uh, and then he, uh, his drug of choice was erythropoietin. And, uh, Sometimes I tell my patients, well, this is the same medication that the uh, Olympic athletes use to build their blood count. And we might give you some 
EPO only for you, it's completely legal. So uh, one thing that we did recently uh, regarding pre-op anemia is we did a, a meta-analysis of erythropoietin uh, to look at whether you can truly uh, reduce uh, allogeneic transfusion in surgical patients. And we found 32 randomized trials, uh, erythropoietin uh, versus uh, placebo control. And we found that the relative risk of a transfusion was 0.59 in the EPO group. So about a 40% reduction in allogeneic transfusion. Uh, in fact, in orthopedic patients, uh, we found an even greater decrease in, uh, in the relative risk of transfusion. Uh, about a, a 64% decrease or an odds ratio of 0.36. So EPO does work, uh, only we have to weigh the risk, the benefits and the cost of treating patients. And the way we do that is we've used our maximum surgical blood order schedule. So some people call this the MSBOS or the MISBOS. So we use it because we wanna be able to rank the surgeries in terms of their relative blood loss. So for example, I told you a thyroidectomy will lose a tablespoon of blood, uh, a Whipple a lot more, but what about a hernia repair? Okay, so what we do is we go to our MSBOS and we, we find the hernia repair and it, it says, hey, you don't even need a type and screen for a hernia repair. So we call that a very low blood loss surgery. So basically, uh, no type and screen is a low blood loss. A type and screen is a medium blood loss. And a cross match order is a higher blood loss. So we use this uh, list to determine how aggressive to treat pre-op anemia. Number six uh, is intraoperative or anesthetic management. An example of that would be tranexamic acid. Uh, TXA is a drug that's been around for 50 years now, uh, but only in the last decade has it been used to dramatically reduce uh, bleeding and transfusion. Uh, so when, when we started using TXA in our hip and knee replacements uh, in about 2014, uh, we found this dramatic decrease in red cell utilization uh, for our joint replacements. Uh, that was the same time, however, when we hired new surgeons and uh, two of those randomized trials came out uh, supporting uh, what I call less is more in terms of uh, hemoglobin triggers. Uh, but transamic acid plays a big role. Overall, it reduces bleeding and transfusion by about 30%. Um, other things the anesthesia team can do uh, is simply just maintaining normal thermia during surgery uh, can reduce bleeding. Uh, patients definitely bleed more below 35 degrees, uh, and there's even evidence that patients bleed more uh, below 36 degrees. And then uh, ANH, acute normal volemic hemodilution, and even controlled hypotension. So some of our uh, orthopedic and spine patients, uh, we can use controlled hypotension uh, to reduce bleeding. So what can the surgeons do to uh, keep the blood in the patient? So they have new types of cautery, for example. Uh, this is a saline irrigated bipolar cautery. You can see they're cutting through the liver uh, and, and there's no bleeding because it seals the blood vessels as it cuts through the tissue. Uh, topical hemostatic agents uh, should never be underrated. Uh, they provide a very, very valuable tool for the surgeons, uh, the thrombin and the gelatin compounds. Uh, some of them have uh, trade names like flow seal, tis seal, evaseal. Uh, those, those topical hemostatics can make a big difference, especially with bleeding from raw surfaces. And then minimally invasive approaches. If you can do 
a radical prostatectomy, for example, uh, with a robotic approach, uh, we've transfused three patients in the last uh, 1,200 robotic prostatectomies. And when I did them open uh, as a resident, every single one of the radical prostates uh, had a transfusion. In fact, they even pre-donated their own blood back then. So robotic surgery for hysterectomies, prostatectomies, we're now even doing uh, pancreatic resections uh, with robotic techniques. Number eight, autologous blood salvage or the cell saver. So at, at one point in time, this was called the centerpiece of blood conservation. Uh, for certain procedures and certain patients, I tell them that, that especially patients who decline transfusion, I tell them that the blood saver, save, <laughs> cell saver could save their lives uh, because uh, at least twice in the last few years uh, that has occurred uh, with, with a surgical misadventure. Uh, one was a GYN case and the other was a tumor on the vena cava. Uh, a renal cell cancer where if the cell saver wasn't there uh, to process two or three liters of lost blood, I don't think the patients would have survived. Uh, luckily, about 90% of our Jehovah's Witness patients, uh, if they understand, will accept the cell saver. So uh, we've shown that cell saver blood is uh, is more uh, higher quality than banked blood. In fact, uh, we looked at 2,3 DPG levels and the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve uh, of cell saver blood and compared it to banked blood. And we found that, that cell saver blood being outside the body for only an hour or two uh, was fresher than banked blood, had normal 2,3 DPG levels uh, and probably delivers oxygen better for that reason. ANH or acute normal volemic hemodilution um, is uh, a way to bank the patient's own blood in the OR prior to incision. So we take off one, two, or three units. I've even taken off four units of the patient's own blood store that blood in citrated bags uh, right there in the operating room. So the patient bleeds at a lower hematocrit during the procedure. And then when the bleeding's finished, you can transfuse uh, the autologous blood back into the patient. One of the main benefits is it's whole blood and it's fresh. So they get the benefits of the clotting factors and the platelets, uh, not just the red cells. We use this a lot during, uh, we use this a lot during cardiac surgery, uh, the ANH, and um, it really does uh, prove to be uh, beneficial. So what about phlebotomy blood loss? Um, that's number nine on the list. Uh, we can decrease the frequency and the number of lab tests that we send uh, Dr. Shander once said that uh, the indication for uh, lab testing in the hospital is the sun coming up in the morning. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, physicians are now ordering less lab tests, uh, only the ones they need, not just a routine daily panel. So we've shown that in the average ICU patient at Johns Hopkins, uh, they were losing about 60 mLs a day uh, to phlebotomy blood loss. Uh, that's about 1% of a patient's blood volume, by the way, uh, which is 1% of your blood is about how much erythropoiesis you have. Uh, you destroy and create about 1% of your red cells every day. So if you're sending 1% of the patient's blood to the lab every day, uh, you're canceling out erythropoiesis. In the neurocritical care unit, um, they use this inline device uh, called a safe set. They were able to reduce phlebotomy blood loss in half. And then my department chair, uh, Dr. Colleen Cook, when she was at the Cleveland Clinic, she did this paper uh, and she, uh, 
she said they were astonished at the amount of bloodletting uh, due to phlebotomy where some of the cardiac surgery patients were losing the equivalent of one or two units of red cells during their hospital stay. Uh, so we've switched to these smaller phlebotomy tubes for our bloodless patients. Uh, these hold about 0.5 mLs. This uh, red, the red large uh, adult tube holds uh, 10 mLs. So that's a 95% a decrease in in uh, phlebotomy blood loss. Ah, here we go. This one holds 10 mLs. This one holds 0.5. 20 times difference in the phlebotomy blood loss between the smallest and largest tubes. Uh, pretty much across the hospital, we switched to the medium sized tubes, these pediatric tubes. Um, the lab uh, doesn't enjoy having these very small tubes because they don't run through the machines uh, and they have to be manually run. Uh, so we switched uh, the whole hospital to the pediatric size tubes. Number 10 on the top 10 list uh, are what we call hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers. Um, these are, um, there's two products that are trying to get on the market. Uh, neither one is FDA approved. Uh, uh, but the one that's available right now, the HemoPure, is only available through compassionate use protocols. Um, it's a bovine hemoglobin and uh, polymerized and cross-linked. Uh, and uh, it, takes, it takes a lot of paperwork, a lot of phone calls, and, and a lot of emails uh, to get emergency uh, approval from your IRB and from the FDA to use HemoPure for compassionate use. Uh, but it's, it's basically a way, uh, it's acellular hemoglobin that carries oxygen and transports CO2. Uh, they never made it to FDA approval, not yet, uh, because of a 2008 study that compared them to banked blood in a meta-analysis and found more heart attacks and more deaths compared to banked blood but we think that they should be compared to no blood, and that study hasn't been done yet. In conclusion, uh, virtually all the patients that we care for can be done uh, without transfusion if you have proper planning and techniques. And our top 10 methods of bloodless care uh, that we just reviewed are effective uh, if you implement them properly. In our program, we have a 24-hour uh, pager on our website. Uh, you can talk to a real person uh, that will answer the page. And we, we even give advice sometimes to hospitals outside of our own health system. This is our website. And um, I was hoping to uh, show a four-minute video. My neck. Look like a bullfrog pumping. Have you ever seen like a bullfrog with a, with a, in its throat pumps like that? That's what my neck looked like. All that blood was regurgitating up there. These flowers are coming out pretty, aren't they? My name's Tammy, live in Christiansburg, Virginia. All my family, for the most part, has been really healthy. And I didn't know I had blood pressure problems. Tammy presented to us with a large aortic aneurysm that you could see pulsating in the base of her neck, right above her breastbone. And that's a ballooning of the artery in the chest. Her blood pressure when she presented was 240 over 40. She had a leak in her aortic valve in her heart. So the one-way valve was allowing two-way blood flow. And yeah, I was like, this blood pressure is like, really? How, why are you still alive? People couldn't believe you're still alive with this blood pressure like that. We searched for a place to go for six months. We found out that Andy Pippa was the coordinator for the bloodless surgery program there at Johns Hopkins. Tammy called us because she couldn't find a doctor or a hospital that would uh, operate on her without resorting to a blood transfusion. I did not want to do this no blood transfusion period. That's one reason it bothered me because they set such a bloody surgery. But with my religion being a Jehovah's Witness, I wasn't going to take any blood. But I also didn't want to die on the operating table either. The fact that she took her stand for, for no blood transfusion and the courage that she showed was an inspiration to me. 
Our bloodless program is designed to care for patients who wish to get therapy for their illnesses or to undergo a surgery without receiving transfused blood products. And so our role as the bloodless program is to care for these patients, to get them ready for surgery when they need surgery, to keep their blood at a, you know, a healthy level. Every time we avoid a transfusion, we avoid potential complications like hepatitis, there's HIV, TACO and TRALI, which are complications from blood transfusion that can be fatal. Okay, so this is a fresh blood sample. So by avoiding unnecessary transfusions, we're actually saving lives. And I haven't met a patient yet that wouldn't rather have their own blood back uh, as opposed to someone else's blood coming from the blood bank. Nobody plans to go to the hospital. It's, it's really a scary place to be. The fact that I can make a patient feel more at ease is key to their having a good outcome. We had to be um, very careful with Tammy because we wanted to be sure that her level of blood, the strength of her blood, was at a safe level for her to get through the surgery. We did several things special in the operating room. First we did something called ANH, where we bank the patient's own blood right before the surgery begins. Then we used a medication called Amicar that reduces bleeding during surgery. And third, uh, we use a device called a cell saver, which collects the blood that patients lose during surgery, cleans it, processes it, and then we can give them back their own blood before the end of the procedure. In Tammy's case, without the cell saver, I'm not sure we could have brought her through the surgery successfully. As our bloodless program has grown over the years, we've gained a lot of experience and expertise in caring for these patients. By providing care to Jehovah's Witness patients, for example, we're perfecting methods of blood conservation that will benefit all patients. The compassionate nature of this team, everybody on it, makes the patients feel special. I'm very grateful for Johns Hopkins, for the bloodless surgery team. I made it, and I did it without their blood.